Hello everybody and welcome back. Today we're gonna be looking at a more complete version of this enemy. You can see already here I have a spawner going on that spawns these axe wielding enemies every few seconds and they already set up to target the player and come back. Try to hit the player, they also react to getting hit by the sword and they have their own attack animations. Even though they're moving quite slowly right now, they're a big threat once they get close. You can see they have a number of different animations for attacking and they can even hit each other if they get too close. For now there are no effects for when they get hit or when they get killed. We will look into adding those later but the basic interactions are now done. So let's quickly look at how that is set up. First let's look at the enemy itself. As you remember from before we have here our model and it's set up with an animator that we saw before where you have the idle state the two attacks that it has, the attack downward and the attack horizontal states. We have the running state for when it's moving, and then we have the hit react state for when the enemy gets hit. As we saw before, the hit react itself is a blend tree that allows us to have different kind of blend animations whenever the enemy gets hit, depending on where they get hit. Well, we already covered all of that in the previous video. Now we're seeing how this is all stitched together and set up to work. The main things to remember about this animator state machine is that we are triggering the attack with the attack downward and attack horizontal parameters here. We have those set up both for whenever the player is idle and whenever the player is running. That way, even if the player is moving, the enemy can still attack. And then from all these states, we have a transition to the hit react state. Whenever the enemy gets hit, the got hit trigger gets set and that allows the animator to go from any state to the hit react state. For that reason, those transitions are also set to have the interruption source enabled so that the hit react state can interrupt any other state. Let's see how that looks in the code. If you remember from the last video, we already had the enemy behavior script, but it's got a little bit more complicated this time around. First of all, we're handling the different states here in the update method. This is probably not going to be the last version of this logic because we still need to figure out a few other states and there are some transitions here that could happen better. But overall, the enemy can be in three main states as it's set up right now. One is when it's ready for attacking and has the target in range, where we're looking at setting the state to attacking, stopping the nav mesh agent that we'll be looking at in a bit, and then starting one of the two attacks, the horizontal or the vertical attack chosen at random. Then if we are not ready for attack, for example, if we are finishing an attack, then we have the is done attacking check here. When if we are finishing the attack, then we can set the enemy to target the player again and start moving towards the enemy. And then if at any point the enemy is moving, we make sure to set the is moving boolean in the animator so that it triggers the running animation state. Then as we had set up last video, we have a number of colliders around the enemy body. And those colliders send an event that triggers the got hit handler method here. This actually has its own cooldown and it first defines that there's, there is a hit that happened from the hit position and from that determines the right blend of the animation to use. Then says the trigger got hit so that the animation for the hit reaction happens. And then it also stops the movement state and it stops the nav mesh agent and starts the cooldown routine so that we reset the cooldown after however many seconds we want to wait for the cooldown, which is set here. Simple wait loop that resets the god hit trigger after a certain amount of seconds that we can define here. There are a few methods here that we're not going to be looking into until a later video, but for now we can check the targeting attack range method that we're using here to figure out if the target is in range. First we check if we actually have a target, if not we skip, but if we have a target we check the distance between the enemy transform and the target transform and if that is less than the attack range then we return true signaling that the target is in range. When we want to trigger an attack with the set random attack we simply choose at random from 0 and 1 in this case and based on that we decide whether we want to trigger the attack downward or the attack horizontal trigger and then we set the moving boolean to false. Similarly when we want to check that the enemy is not attacking we are checking whether the animator is in the current state of idle 
or in the current state of running. That means that if the animator here is either running or idle, we know that the enemy is not attacking. That way we're checking that we don't allow the enemy to move into the attack phase directly from the attack downward, hit reaction, or attack horizontal states. And then we have a check here to figure out if the nav mesh agent is moving. We're simply checking if the square magnitude of the velocity is above zero. If the agent is moving in any direction whatsoever, the square magnitude is going to be greater than zero. That way we don't have to check both for positive or negative values. One thing that is important to remember about the enemy behavior script that we have here is that we're handling two different components here. One is the animator that we've been looking at, but the other is the nav mesh agent that got added. This both controls the enemy movement around the space, and it also controls the enemy animation. These two are quite intertwined and they need to work well together. Otherwise, you may see the enemy model sliding around instead of walking or shifting around during the animation, which is a very jarring and unpleasant effect when you have both movement triggered by the animation and triggered by the nav mesh agent. That's why it's important to set here the agent is stopped to true and false appropriately. Whenever we want to make sure that the nav mesh agent doesn't influence the movement of the enemy model, we need to make sure that agent is stopped is equal to true. If this is not set up, it's possible that the enemy will slide in or out during the attack animation, for example, or during the hit reaction animation. He will still move closer to the player if it's not set to is stopped equal true. Now let's see a few other additions. First, if you remember, we set up the child damageable. The child damageable component is added here to different parts of the enemy bones. So we can set up the right collider for that body part and we can make that body part damageable, meaning that whenever any weapon hits this collider, it will trigger the damage behavior in the parent dam damageable here. This is used so that we can actually have these colliders inside the body handle the weapon collision and handle the, the triggering of the weapon effects without having to surface that event all the way to the parent damageable that is here in this cooldown damageable component. This also has another component that is the enemy child hit handler. We're going to see that one next. But yes, the only thing that the child damageable script is doing here is to forward the receive damage call to the parent damageable. If you remember from previous videos, the damager component that is in the axe, for example, in the sword, triggers the receive damage behavior in whichever damageable it hits. For this child damageable, what we do is capture that receive damage call and forward it to the parent damageable so that we have only one place where the enemy health is kept track of, but we can have that be damaged from any body part of the enemy. And that gives us access to specifically the hit position, which is gonna be very useful next. We get that in the enemy child hit handler. This simply keeps track of the enemy behavior component in the parent and then triggers the god hit handler that we mentioned before with the transform position of the child. That means that if, for example, the enemy here gets hit on the arm or on the shoulder, the child damageable will be used to handle the receive damage call that will be forwarded to the parent damageable listed here. And then the enemy child hit handler will also get called by the undamaged behavior here. And that will forward the call to the god hit handler in the parent here in the enemy behavior, which you can see uses the hit position of the child hit handler to determine the direction of the hit. This is what allows us to influence the enemy animation by knowing that the enemy got hit on their right arm or their left arm or their left leg or the head. We get that information from the child hit handler. Then as you may have seen, the enemy has a damageable component, but it's not just any damageable, it's a cooldown damageable. This one has the cooldown behavior integrated. That means that whenever we're calling the receive damage on this particular damageable, we trigger a small core routine to handle the cooldown, much like we did in the enemy behavior, and then reject any damage that comes to that damageable while the cooldown is happening. This fixes the issue of being able to just randomly swing the sword around and causing damage to the enemy. The enemy actually has a cooldown and within that cooldown, the enemy has enough time to trigger 
an attack animation, which actually adds a little bit of difficulty to the fight because you cannot just be constantly hitting the enemy. You have to weave in, hit the enemy and weave out or move away from the attack pattern while the enemy is in cooldown and then once the cooldown is done, you attack the enemy again. For now, since we don't have any visual cues or any cues at all that the enemy is in cooldown, it makes the interaction a little bit weird and makes it difficult for the player to know that the enemy is during a cooldown and that they're not receiving any damage. But once we add the right visual cues or other ways of telling the player that the enemy is invulnerable during that period, it'll make for a better game mechanic. And it will be a lot easier for the player to figure out when to hit the enemy and when to avoid any attack. Similarly, we also have a player damageable now. This inherits directly from the cooldown damageable. So it also has a cooldown integrated for the player. But since we don't want to destroy the player when the health of the player is depleted, we have a different behavior here on death. We actually haven't hooked anything up to this, but this is what we will use to call later for showing up a game over screen or making the player spawn back at the previous spawn point, say the town or something like that. And just in general, be able to trigger any kind of penalty that we subject the player to whenever they get hit too much and their hit points drop below zero. Other than that, we are also keeping track of the current hit points in a separate updatable float variable here. We haven't seen that yet, but that is used to show the player how many hit points they have left. You can see it here, but the player has on their left hand an indicator of how many hit points are left. For now, this is obviously a placeholder. We'll look into adding a better graphic and a better way of showing the hit points left for the player. But for now, this tells the player that they have, in this case, 100 hit points left. And finally, the other thing that you saw in the initial demo is the constant spawner. Much like we had an instant spawner that spawns the loot when you destroy the trees or the rocks so you can collect the logs and the stone, we have here a constant spawner that will just continuously spawn, in this case, axe-wielding enemies up to a certain limit that we can define. If you remember from before, we have a spawner config that we can use here. If we take a look at that, you can see here that we have defined a limit of 5 axe enemies to spawn at a time. We have a variable here to set a delay between spawns. We have the prefab that we want to spawn, which is the axe wielder that we were looking before, and we have a spawn range here so that the enemy doesn't spawn always in the same place, but spawns in the same area. And we can see here that the delay currently is 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, this spawner will be spawning new enemies up to a number of five. You can see that here we have the spawner config that you saw. We have a reference to the spawn origin and the parent transform that we want to use. Then we have a boolean here to start spawning immediately or to wait for the spawn method to be called. And then we keep here a list of the spawn instances that we're going to be using to check whether or not we have reached the maximum allowed of instances at this time. And then we have a boolean here to track if we've entered the spawn loop or not. After a quick initialization here, we have the spawn method that calls a coroutine. We are using here the spawning boolean to prevent the spawn method from being called multiple times because each time would create a new coroutine. So we will be spawning in one coroutine up to, let's say, five enemies and in the second coroutine another five. So we will end up with 10. This way we only have one spawning loop happening at a time. And here's the spawning loop. When we enter the loop, we set spawning to true. And then while true, which means that we will be looping over this forever. We check if we should spawn a new enemy. And if we should, then much like in previous spawner configurations, we take the spawn origin position and we add to it randomly from the selected range that we put in the config here. And then we instantiate the prefab at that position in the original rotation and parent it to the parent transform that we have selected from before. And we also add that instance to the list so we can keep track of it later. And regardless of whether we spawn a new enemy or not, we always wait the allotted delay between spawns. So we're only actually checking this loop, in this case, every 10 seconds, no matter if we have enemies to spawn or not. And then here in the shoot spawn check, we first set the count to zero and initialize a new list for any instances that we need to remove. This is used to handle the case where Previous enemies that had been spawned before have been killed and therefore no longer count towards 
spawn count. So let's say that if we were in the middle of spawning the third enemy and the first enemy just got killed, we actually only have two enemies spawned. So we still have three more slots to go. So here we go through every instance that we have in the spawn spawned instances list. And then we check if the instance is equal to null, that means that the enemy was killed and destroyed. Then we remove that instance from the list. Otherwise, we add it to the count. At the end of that loop, we go through every instance that we need to remove and we remove it from the list. One thing to remember, which is very important, is that we cannot remove instances while looping through the list. Because if we were to remove the instance here, when we first know that it's not a valid reference anymore, it would actually trigger an error because we would be mutating the list while looping through it. That's why we wait for a second loop here to remove those instances from the list. And then here at the end, we simply return true if the current spawn count is less than the instances to spawn determined in the spawner config. And that is what we have for today. Here we can see that the enemies are being spawned and when they get hit by the sword, they trigger the got hit reaction. Otherwise, they go through their attack animation where they're close. You can see this one is choosing only the downward attack, but they can actually choose from both the horizontal and the downward. And they can even hurt each other if they get too close and they hit themselves with their axes. Of course, I can also swing the sword and kill them as well. And for now, they're very slow, but that helps because they cannot swarm you that easily. But they are very good at making good damage with the, those attacks. Cool. So that is all I have for today. In the next videos, we'll be looking and adding some of those visual cues and sound cues so that the player can know what's going on when they're in combat with the enemy. And also we'll be looking at the enemy loot system so we can also have the enemies spawn loot when they are defeated. So we can use that as another mechanic to add to the game. But we will see that in the next video. That is all for this video. Thank you for sticking around with me. I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.